In the previous video, we introduced the notions of logical inference and talked about a valid argument. That is an argument for which if all of the premises are true, then the conclusion has to necessarily be true. Now, not all arguments have to be valid. And therefore, if you have an argument that is invalid, then we can't necessarily guarantee the truthfulness of the conclusion, even if the premises are true. Um, this is an example of what we call a logical fallacy. A logical fallacy is whenever we can't guarantee the conclusion of an argument based upon the premises of the argument. If a argument is invalid, then it is uh, a logical fallacy. And so in this video, I actually want to present the two most common logical fallacies that come from invalid arguments. That is the truthfulness of the premise doesn't guarantee the truthfulness of the conclusion. So let's give an example of such a one. Uh, consider the following argument. If I have the new calling plan, then I can text my friends for free. Now, again, if anyone is watching this video and you're like, wait, was there ever a time you couldn't text your friends for free? Well, yes, back in the Stone Age, I have to apologize here. When, you know, cell phones first came out, they didn't necessarily have free texting. This was sort of an add-on feature or they they cost you, they, they charge you by the text. I know we lived like animals back then, not free. You know, texting wasn't necessarily included in the plan. Uh, but let, let's, let's pretend we live in those dark ages right now. Um, if you have the new calling plan, then I can text my friends for free. And then the second statement here in your argument is I can text my friends for free. And therefore, I have the new calling plan. Okay, let's look at the structure of this argument here. Um, this first one is conditional. So let's break it up into two primitive statements. Let's call the first one, I have the new calling plan, statement P. And let's take the second statement, I can text my friends for free as statement Q. And so then that first statement, if P then Q, we can write in the following form, okay? Then you look at the second statement right here, I can text my friends for free. That's just statement Q. And then therefore, you get P right there because uh, the last statement, I have the new calling plan. So the argument being made here is P implies Q, Q, therefore P. Is this a valid argument? Does the truth value of the premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Well, like we considered in the previous video, we can prove an argument is valid, or in this case, invalid, from a truth table. We construct a truth table where we consider all the possibilities of all the truth values of the primitives, in this case, P and Q. So we have four rows for those possibilities. Then we're gonna list every single premise, So we and we're gonna do it in order, P implies Q and Q, and then the conclusion P. Now what we have to do is we have to look for every row for which all the premises are true. You'll notice that in the first row, P implies Q and Q are true statements. This is followed up by a true P. That's, that's great and dandy. That does by itself does not say that the argument is valid. Um, when you look at the second row, you'll see that both premises are false. So we can ignore this row entirely. It has no bearing on our, on our arguments validity. Um, when you look at the third row, well, let's actually jump to the fourth row for a second. You'll notice that um, one of the premises is true. The other one's false. We ignore that row entirely. Okay. Um, it's the third row that's going to be of consequence here. You'll notice that in the third row, both premises are true. So true and true. But on the other hand, the conclusion is false. So in this case, this is then evidence that the argument is invalid. Now, sure, there was a row where the conclusion was true when the premises were true, but there's also, more importantly, a row for which the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. What this tells us is that the truth of the premises does not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. The conclusion could be true or it could be false. We cannot guarantee its truth and therefore this is an invalid argument. And when you look at the argument itself, you perhaps can see it. Oh, sure. If you have the new plan, then you can text for free. You can text for free, therefore you have the new plan. No, 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 no. I guess there could be other reasons you could text for free. Perhaps there's old plans that... Um, there are old plans that you could text for free, then you just have one of those. Just because the new plan gives you free texting doesn't mean that no other plan gives you free texting. There could be an other explanation that doesn't guarantee that you have the new plan. 
And so this argument we see right here, which is definitely invalid, is an example of what we call the fallacy of converse. And this is perhaps the most common logical fallacy that people ever make, the fallacy of converse, where we have some established implication, P implies Q. Now, we know by the law of detachment, if P is true, then Q is true. But the converse, which is the reverse of that, is not necessarily true. Um, a statement and it, a conditional and its converse are not logically equivalent. The conditional could be true when its converse is false or vice versa. And so if we had the converse P implies Q and we know Q, then we would get P, right? If the converse is true, then this is just the law of detachment. This is a valid argument. But because the converse is not logically equivalent to the conditional, we don't have it. And therefore, we don't know if it's true or not. And therefore, we could get disagreement here. We don't, we can't guarantee it's true. So you have to watch out for the fallacy of converse. The fallacy here is you're assuming that a conditional is equivalent to its converse, which it's not. We don't necessarily have implications in both directions. There could be other other explanations that would explain why P, why Q is true without it being P. Now, certainly if P is true, then Q would have to be true. But just because Q is true doesn't mean it was because of P. There could have been some other reason for doing that. So this is one of the most dangerous, most common uh, types of logical fallacies. And so considering an example of such a thing, uh, determine whether the following argument is valid or not. Um, if I win the lottery, then I'll take my family on a vacation to Hawaii. I took my family on a vacation to Hawaii. Therefore, I won the lottery. Looking at this argument again, if P is winning the lottery and if Q is going to Hawaii, then the first statement could be written as P implies Q. The second statement, I took my family on a vacation to Hawaii. That's Q. And therefore, I won the lottery. This is an example of the fallacy of converse, and therefore this is an invalid argument. There could be other reasons why I took my family on a vacation to Hawaii. Maybe I didn't win the lottery. Maybe my great aunt Ruth died and left me a lot of money. I don't even know who great aunt Ruth is, but I appreciate the check. In which case, then I celebrate her death by taking my family to Hawaii. And maybe I'm not celebrating her death. I'm just celebrating the, the inheritance, what have you. But... Whatever the reason, there could be other reasons to explain the vacation to Hawaii that don't necessarily come from winning the lottery. Again, the fallacy of converse is essentially assuming a conditional statement, P implies Q, is logically equivalent to its converse, Q implies P. That is not the case, and we have seen that previously. And so as I end this lecture, I do want to mention something related to the converse of the fallacy of converse, which is known as the fallacy of inverse, uh, which has the, the following structure. P implies Q, not P, therefore not Q. Um, the argument structure you can kind of see is the following, right? P implies Q, we know that. Now, if, if the premise doesn't hold for the conditional, then you're saying, oh, the conclusion doesn't hold either. But that's not true either. Much like the previous example, right, that if I say that if I win the lottery, then I'll take my family to Hawaii, I didn't win the lottery, therefore I didn't take my family to Hawaii. That's the exact same fallacy as before, because if dear great aunt Ruth passes away, I could still take my family to Hawaii, even though I didn't win the lottery. There could be other reasons to explain it. Now, we've learned before that when you have a conditional statement, um, this is equivalent to its contrapositive, for which the contrapositive of a statement is not P implies not, sorry, not Q implies not P. Um, there's also the converse of a statement, uh, which is Q implies P. This is equal to the inverse of a statement. which is not P implies not Q. Uh, so as we've talked about these different logical structures, so there's the valid argument, the law of detachment, that basically is saying that um, if P implies Q and P happens, then Q happens. That's a valid argument. The law of contraposition is basically using the fact that conditionals and their contrapositives are logically equivalent to each other. So that's also a valid argument. Conversely, in this video, we saw that the, the fallacy of converse, supposing that a converse of a statement is equivalent to its conditional, that's an invalid argument because those things are not logically equivalent. And then similarly here, the fallacy of inverse is supposing that an inverse 
of a conditional is logically equivalent, which is also false. So you must be you must be cautious of logical fallacies because if you use a logical fallacy in a proof, that makes your proof in, invalid, right? You know, if you have a brownie and there's a little bit of feces in it, just a little bit, don't eat any of the brownie, right? None of the brownie is acceptable because it's contaminated by the logical fallacy. So we have to be very cautious to avoid these in the future. Um, we'll talk about some more about more logical fallacies in the next lecture, but that does bring us to the end of lecture 12 for right now. Thanks for watching. If you learned anything in these videos, please like them, subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this in the future. And as always, if you have any questions, please post them in the comments below and I'll be glad to answer them as soon as I can.